Thing. Order! Order! And you are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> yourself, man. Now, in just a few minutes' time, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, will be giving evidence to MPs who sit on the Influential Liaison Committee. They're expected to quiz Theresa May on issues that include the economy, security and borders, with preparations for Brexit likely to dominate. Uh, she's just sat down. Let's listen in. There's a risk of no Brexit at all. Now, could you tell us why you said that and how could that happen? I said that because there are members of the House of Commons who clearly, from their interventions to me in statements and from other comments that they have been making, wish to ensure that we don't leave the European Union. Now, there may be various ways in people, way people wish to uh, do that, but uh, that I think that this is... We're at a point where we have negotiated a deal that people thought we would never be able to negotiate. We have negotiated a good deal for the United Kingdom. We have, and there is a, a clear choice, I think, for members of Parliament. It's important that we honour the vote of the referendum. It's important that we deliver on Brexit. This is a deal that does that. It delivers on what people voted for, but it also ensures that we can protect jobs, protect people's livelihoods, protect our union and protect uh, our okay, security. Well, now, we do understand those points, but would you accept that the only way in which there could be no Brexit at all, which is one of the possibilities you have told the House of Commons might come to pass, would be through another vote of the people? Is, it, is that the only way you think no Brexit could happen? There's, there's a ways in which uh, the, some members of the House want to delay Brexit. Uh, Brexit, in, as far as I'm concerned, takes place on the 29th of March 2019. You will have heard from uh, individuals within the House who ask about extending Article 50, that there are people who think the way to uh, you know, avoid Brexit on the 29th of March is to extend Article 50. Uh, what I'm saying is that actually what people need to focus on and what I hope people want to focus on right. is the choice before us of actually ensuring that we deliver on the vote of the British people, but doing it in a way that protects jobs, protects our security and protects right. our union. So nothing it could result in no Brexit at all, is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is that, that what I am saying is that if you listen to members of the House of Commons, you will hear a variety of views as to what should be happening on this issue. There are those there are those who would be happy to leave without a deal. There are those who wish to leave with a deal. There are those who don't want to leave at all. And within that, there are people who think that perhaps a route uh, is uh, a second referendum. Uh, I think that is an attempt to frustrate uh, Brexit. Uh, there are those who talk about extending Article 50. I think that is an attempt to frustrate Brexit. I'm focused on delivering on what the British people voted for. OK. Uh, are you looking at staying in the European Economic Area and a customs union as a potential alternative if your deal is defeated? Is there any internal planning going on in Number 10? As I have made clear, my focus is on the vote that will take place in the, uh, on the 11th of December here in this House. I think we understand that, that is, Prime yes, Minister. Yes, but uh, I'm, I'm sorry, But is there Mr. any Baird. planning I'm sorry, Mr. going Baird. on for that? What, what I am focused on and what the government is focused on is the vote that will take place on December the 11th. You want uh, to look at all sorts of options and ideas sure. and so on and so forth. <laughs> I think it's important that members of Parliament focus on the nature of this vote. This is an important point in our history. It is a vote on which we will be deciding whether to deliver on the will of the British people. And the good deal that I put forward does that in a way that protects I understand their that, jobs, but any responsible government will be planning in case the deal doesn't go through. And the question I'm asking you is, is there planning going on for a different approach if the deal is defeated? Because it'd be very strange if you said to us there's no planning going on. The, uh, what has been made clear from the European Union uh, and uh, was made clear at the weekend is that this is the deal that has been negotiated and this is the deal that people need to focus on when they're looking at the, uh, at the vote. OK. The Chancellor also said yesterday that there will be a cost to leaving the European Union because there will be impediments to trade. He's right, isn't he? Well, there will be the, 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 
the question, when the, this is uh, often put in a, a, a variety of uh, ways, this issue about what will happen when we leave the European Union, obviously there's analysis that's been provided by the Bank of England, short-term analysis, short-term forecast of what would happen in a no-deal scenario. The government's analysis that uh, was provided to Parliament sets out a number of, of uh, uh, potential, uh, uh, you know, it looks at different comparisons, no-deal, the government's white paper, EEA, and, the, uh, and a sort of average free trade agreement. What that looks at is the impact of trade. We've all, we, we've, all, we've all read that. One thing, surely, that is clear from that, that no deal is no longer better than a bad deal, because that would be the worst outcome of all, wouldn't it? Well, that depends on what a bad deal looks like, I suggest. But the, obviously, the impact of no deal uh, has been forecast at the request of the Treasury Select Committee by the, uh, by the Bank of England. If you look at the uh, issues that have been raised by this uh, analysis, what they show is yeah. that the deal that we have negotiated is the best deal for jobs and the economy, which honours the referendum and enables us to take but the is there a worse deal? Is there a worse deal than no deal? Well, this deal, the deal we've negotiated is certainly not that. It's a good deal. No, but you just said that no deal might not be the worst outcome because there could be an even worse one. What could that be? Well, um, there, there isn't a, there, there isn't right, there a deal isn't on the okay. table that is in that uh, category. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Coming now to Rachel Reeves. Well, thank you, Chairman, and thank you very much, Prime Minister, for coming to give evidence to us uh, this morning. Uh, following on from what Hilary Benn said, and given the analysis both by the bank and by the government yesterday on how catastrophic a no deal would be, and I know that the Prime Minister takes her responsibilities to our country very seriously. Will, therefore, the Prime Minister rule out that whatever happens in the vote on the 11th of December, that her government would consider leaving the European Union without a deal? Well, we will be leaving the European Union on the 29th of March 2019. And when we come to the vote on the 11th of December, uh, it will be for parliamentarians and members of parliament to determine whether they want to deliver on the vote that the British people took, um, whether they want to do that with a good deal which actually does protect people's jobs into the future. Uh, that is, we, we are promoting a good deal. But that's, with we respect, Prime Minister, that wasn't my question. I'm asking whether you will rule out the possibility that on the 29th of March we could leave the European Union without a, a deal. Given what we know now from the Bank of England, from your government's own analysis, will you rule that out as a possibility? It would be so catastrophic. The, the decision that the House of Commons will take on the 11th of December, it will be whether to, to support, whether to ratify the deal that the United Kingdom government has negotiated with the European so Union. If, Parliament... if, if, if the House votes down that deal at that point, then there will be some steps that will be necessary because obviously we've been doing no deal planning as a government. We've made certain information available to businesses. Um, but at, at a point at which the, if the House were to vote down the deal that has been agreed, given that the European Union has been clear that this is the deal that has been agreed and this is the deal that is on the table, then obviously decisions would have to be taken so in you, relation to the action that would need to so be taken. So if voted for... down the deal on the 11th of December, would you really, Prime Minister, given what we now know from the analysis, uh, contemplate taking Britain out of the European Union on the 29th of March without a deal, without your deal, without any if, deal? If Parliament votes down the deal on the 11th of December, there, will, there is then a process, as you know, that is in the legislation for the length of time for, uh, given for government to come back and make a statement about the next steps. But the timetable is such that actually some people would need to take some practical steps in relation to no deal if the government were to vote, if the Parliament were to vote down uh, the deal on the 11th of December. OK, let's turn now to your deal. It's disappointing, Prime Minister, that your deal, the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration were not modelled in the government's own analysis and instead the analysis is on the July white paper rather than your deal. Um, why was that, Prime Minister? Is it because, frankly, there is insufficient detail in the political declaration to model it at all? The, uh, as you know, the political declaration sets a spectrum in relation to the balance of rights and obligations of access to the market versus uh, uh, acceptance of, uh, of rules, uh, which has obviously an impact on checks at the border. What we have done, that is, and the detail of that is being negotiated, it is still open for frictionless trade, 
Uh, what I have said in the House of Commons is that, and I've been honest with people, we haven't persuaded everybody in Europe yet about absolutely frictionless trade. The ambition is there to be as near frictionless in the political declaration, to be as near frictionless as possible. What we did do, we thought it was right to do, was to set out the sensitivity analysis of that spectrum. And we took a midpoint on that spectrum, which is the 50% sensitivity analysis, <laughs> which has been identified. And I think if you look at some of the comments that have been given about the analysis that the government has put forward, for example, the chief economist of the IFG has been clear that they set tests that we needed to address to ensure MPs and others were able to scrutinise the modelling and interpret it appropriately. And those tests, the published report passes those tests and is something that should be taken seriously. But given that in July uh, the white paper had in it frictionless trade, and as you just said, Prime Minister, the pol political declaration wasn't able to achieve that objective, can we assume that the, uh, um, the outcome of the, the political declaration without frictionless trade will be a worse economic outcome than what was in the July white paper? The, uh, what the analysis has shown is a 50% sensitivity point. There's a spectrum in relation to that, uh, that uh, analysis, which, of course, goes alongside the spectrum of checks versus access to the markets. Uh, but it is not the case, it is still the government's position that we will be uh, negotiating to achieve uh, frictionless trade. What you see in the political declaration, and you'll see it in the language around the ambition for uh, ambitious customs arrangements in the future, is a clear recognition of the need to reduce that friction as much as possible. I think it's still better to reduce it to, uh, to have frictionless trade, um, but as I say, uh, there are those in the European Union who uh, have yet to be persuaded of that um, argument. Well, I think the European Union are very much in favour of frictionless trade. That's why they're in the single market and the customs union, Prime Minister. Um, you said yesterday in Prime Minister's questions that um, the, 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 the um, analysis does not show that we will be poorer in the future. But the government analysis published yesterday shows that we will be £100 billion a year as a country worse off £1,100 per person per year. So can you confirm that under all scenarios analysed by the um, government analysis, we will be poorer in the future compared with our current position in the European Union? Yes. That's what the government analysis shows, isn't it, Prime Minister? Can I explain <coughs> why I, I, uh, what I said in the Prime Minister's questions and why I made that point? I think if you went out to a member of the public and said, we're going to be poorer outside the European Union than inside the European, than, than we are today, they, 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 poorer outside the EU, they assume you mean poorer than today. Actually, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is the economy will continue to grow. We will be better off in the future. The question is about the relative rates of growth on, in, the, uh, in the different models that are identified. The point is that being inside the European Union is not an option. Mm -hmm. But you uh, say you can so confirm, what we, have to, what we have to look at is what is the best option outside the European Union because people have voted to leave the EU. And the best, what the analysis shows is that the best option outside the, the uh, European Union, uh, which del obviously delivers on the vote by being outside the EU, uh, but is also the best for jobs and the economy. I Compared well, we appear, with our current so relationship. We lost the Prime Minister and we now what, have her back. Let's just see if we uh, have the signal again. Is that there will be an impact on the, growth, on the rate of growth in the United Kingdom looking ahead. Uh, other things being equal. But of course, and that impact other things, will be negative. But, no, other, but other things will not necessarily be equal. This is why I made a slightly, um, what some might require, as a record a slightly flip comment about forecasts and economic forecasts in uh, response to a question in the statement, I think on Monday or, or last week. But the point is that there are many variables that can change that will impact in relation to uh, what happens to our economy outside the, uh, outside the European Union. Some of those are in our hands and decisions that we will be taking as a government. Obviously, there are other uh, aspects in terms of the interna international trade. You know, by, in 2020, 90 per cent of the growth, in, in, uh, of, uh, growth is due to be outside the yes, European Union. Yes, but that is all Union. modelled with respect, Prime Minister, in the government. No, it's not all. No, no, it's not all modelled. The, the, the trade assumptions analysis. about the growth um, in the rest of the world is, is modelled, and the trade assumptions are 
in the government's uh, analysis. The government's analysis show under all scenarios we will be poorer compared with our current relationship. That is what the government analysis shows. Can I just be clear? The government analysis does not identify, does not deal with all the issues that I've spoken about because it doesn't deal with decisions that government might take. It and it can't. Trade, Prime it can't. It assumes that we come to trade deals with the United States, Australia, um, um, yes. New Zealand and other countries so that trade assumptions are in the government yes. analysis, Prime Minister. Thank you. Meg Hillier. Prime Minister, you have said that austerity is coming to an end but all the economic analysis shows there will be less government income when we leave. So how are you going to end austerity? <coughs> well, we're already showing how we end austerity. We're showing how we end austerity in the uh, in the budget. We're showing how we end austerity by right, the sorry, no, money but, but Minister, we'll be putting in the national sorry, that, that's now, but I'm saying when we leave. There's going to be less money, and yet, there's, you've said austerity is coming to an end. Um, there's a p 20 billion going into the NHS, for example, but there's a lot of other demands, as my committee highlights routinely. How are you going to end austerity with the financial challenges we'll have when well, we leave? The, what we are going to do in terms of ending austerity is ensure that we are able to continue to uh, deal with our debt and see our debt falling uh, but, and put more money into public services. We will be doing that as our economy grows into the future, as the economy will continue to grow into, uh, into the future. But, but Prime Minister, we've economy, you've, you've just, we sorry, Prime Minister, but you've said to, in response to Rachel Reeves, the economy will grow at a lower rate in your view, on the basis of this economic analysis. So there's less money coming in. So will you be raising taxes or increasing debt? No, the, the economic analysis shows the trade impact, and that trade impact shows the impact on the rate of growth in the future, other things being equal. Other things, of course, will not necessarily be equal in terms of government decisions and, and so forth. So that's why I say that you have to be very careful when you quote the analysis in looking at exactly what, um, what it, it is. But if you look at the, but in the spending review next year, we will be setting out the spending path and plans for the government over the next few, three yes. years when we are outside the European Union. Now, there are, many, there are many aspects that will go into that. There are also many issues, I mean, I could point out to you, not in answer to your question, but I well, could point out as a separate well, point that the Bank of England analysis actually shows that our deal does have that sort of deal dividend. Well, uh, well the bank, in, but the Bank of ahead. England analysis, uh, is, 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 uh, well, you know, Mark Carney has said, uh, was, was the worst recession since the 30s. So there will be less money coming in. The spending review... No, but the, bank the, spending, of England, the Bank of England analysis is in no deal well, situation. Yes. Well, that's one of the options that's out there, as the Chair highlighted. We, we have a very uh, rocky vote coming up uh, in the next 13 days. So given where we are at now, given that the spending review could be... A, will be the first post-Brexit spending uh, set up for the government, there will be less money available under any analysis, especially if we crash out. How are you going to end austerity? Was that spending review going to be a cuts round? You will. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you what the spending review is going to have in it before we before the spending review no. is. But you is have two up. Prime Minister, but you have no, simply no, you have two options. No, you could raise much. taxes or you could increase debt. No. They're the simple no. options. I mean, obviously, there's a lot more to it. But in simple. Well, terms. there is a lot more to it, with due respect, and well, I think you understand that, that there's yeah. a lot more to it, and those are not. And let's just look at you know, look at some of the circumstances. Back in the summer, when we announced the money into the National Health Service. We spoke, I mean, there is the money that we will no longer be paying into the European Union, but we also spoke about, we also spoke about the fact that at that stage we thought we might need to uh, ask people to contribute more through taxes into yes. the money that we're putting in the National Health Service. What we then saw in the budget is that we have been able to show how we fund that, uh, fund that National Health Service increase in, in, uh, uh, without actually asking people to raise uh, taxes. So this is why I'm saying you don't... There are, these aren't well, absolutes that but either you do absolutely. this or well, you, well, do, either we, you do Y or you do X. But we can, there are many variables in this. We get a lot there of spoken mirrors from your ministers about how, finance, how, how government finance is, is going. But to, today we hear that the Met Police, and certainly experience of mine and my constituency, are not investigating a third of all crimes. We've had, through my committee, we see routinely real challenges in the public services. So if austerity is over, you're going to have to fund that somehow. <clears throat> we're going to have a, less money coming in after Brexit, so what's the plan? And you will see how we will be funding our public services over the next three years when we announce the spending review. Right, well, and, and on the withdrawal agreement, as my colleague has highlighted, that hasn't been uh, properly uh, modelled yet. Is there other plans to have some modelling of that before Parliament, before the vote? The withdrawal agreement? Uh, the, uh, the, the plan, yeah, the withdrawal agreement. 
and the political agreement. You mean the political declaration? Sorry, yes. The, These are yes, two separate. Yes, sorry, yes. I mean the political declaration. Yes, me, the the political declaration mm -hmm. is the uh, is the uh, uh, sets out. It yeah, sets yeah. out the spectrum. I know what it sets out. I've yeah. been clear yeah. about what the government will be aiming to achieve. But the, anal but the government across an analysis looked at this different options, but not the option that's before us. That's the point. The, what the, there is a spectrum. So will it be doing? Will you be doing that? Before there is a those? spectrum that is identified in the political declaration. We will be negotiating uh, in relation to the rights and obligations, access to market versus checks that will be necessary. What we have done in the analysis, and it is in, I think it's entirely right and proper, and that is accepted by external bodies, we have put the sensitivity analysis so that people can see, have some idea of the impact of uh, the variation of where we appear on that spectrum. The aim of the political declaration, the clear intent of the political declaration, is to be as low down that spectrum as possible. I, I will continue to argue for it to be frictionless. Okay, is there any more information going to be coming to Parliament before the vote? about the economic impacts of Brexit on the basis of the deal that you've struck? No, the, we have provided the economic you, you, analysis. Okay, well, okay, well, we'd say it doesn't go fine. For. Can I just move on to the preparedness of government? We've, my committee has produced nine unanimous reports in the last year looking at government preparedness. And there's a real concern that the very best outcome is suboptimal, especially if we crash out without a deal. So what, what are you going to be doing to make sure that there is proper support for business and taxpayers generally to deal with the outfall of Brexit, given that we, we have shown, dem demonstrably shown, that government departments aren't going to be ready in time? Well, uh, government departments are, as you know, the Treasury has put uh, uh, money, made money available to government departments to deal with both preparing for a deal and preparing for no deal. That's entirely right and proper. All those arrangements well, We know are the money's there, I mean, but, but they, haven't, they haven't, they acknowledge, many of your civil, civil servants have acknowledged that it's suboptimal, that they're not going to be able to deliver everything perfectly on the 29th of March. Do you agree with that? They, well, on the 29th of March, if we agree the withdrawal agreement, of course, what we will be doing is saying we'll be leaving the European Union, but the implementation period will give us that period of time when we'll be continuing to operate, be operating much as today, and therefore uh, the, uh, the, the, the issue, I think you're questioning, is no deal preparations. If we come out on the 29th of March without a deal, what will the preparations be? As I've just made clear, um, yeah. of course, there will be some key decisions to be taken depending on the outcome of the vote on uh, the 11th of December. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Uh, Prime Minister, you were in Scotland yesterday for a flying visit in what seemed almost like a valiant attempt to drum up opposition to your deal. Scotland will be worse off because of what you propose. The Scottish Government reckon it could be up to £1,600 per person for every Scot. We didn't vote to leave the European Union. Apparently now 70% of people want to stay. Why should Scots even start to think about getting behind your deal? This is a good deal for the whole of the United Kingdom. If you look at uh, what, is, what we've seen in Scotland, we've seen this being supported by the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, by the uh, National Farmers Union of Scotland, by employers like Diageo. Uh, where I was yesterday at Bridge of Weir, we were discussing their supply chains uh, across Europe, the importance of no tariffs, the political declaration is clear, no tariffs, uh, no quantitative restrictions, no rules of origin uh, uh, requirements. Uh, these are good for employers across Scotland. Uh, we, and we went into the EEC as the whole United Kingdom, and we will be living, leaving uh, the, the European the Union as the whole United Kingdom. It's not Kingdom. supported by most Scots. 70%, according to the latest opinion poll, opposed this. Every single local authority area voted to remain in the UK, uh, remain in the EU. Is a, is a message from Scotland to you, now is not the time to be leaving the EU to make us poorer? We have negotiated a deal that will be good for jobs and good for the Scottish economy. And uh, that, is, that is reflected in the remarks that have been made by, as I say, employers and other and organisations in uh, in Scotland. Uh, Scotland is part of the United Kingdom, uh, and what is, of course, most important for the Scottish economy is its continuation inside the internal market of the United Kingdom. Well, why did you reject so utterly every representation that was made to you by the democratically elected Scottish government to try and soften the global <coughs> impact to Scotland. You've, you've looked at issues across what you call the family of nations of the United Kingdom, and all of them have managed to secure some sort of differential deal and agreement which sort of matches their own specific population and economic profile. Why was it all right for every other part of the UK family, but it wasn't all right for Scotland? 
No, that, well, first of all, I'm afraid I don't accept the premise of, of the question that you've given to me. Um, what we do have is particular arrangements for Northern Ireland, because Northern Ireland is in a different situation from any other part of the United Kingdom, because it will have a land border with a country that is a member of the European Union. We have also the other two protocols which are specific to the wider United Kingdom family, are the protocol in relation to Gibraltar and in relation to the sovereign base areas on Cyprus. It is not the case that every single part of the United Kingdom or the United Kingdom family has a specific arrangement made for it. Well, it always seems like it is to, to us. Uh, can I turn to immigration? And I think one of your most... The one you've, achievement about the zeal you've, you've most crowed about, I think, is the ending of freedom of movement. Now, Scotland's, <laughs> Scotland's population growth is almost totally predicated on inward immigration. It's absolutely vital to our population demography and to our economy. Um, can I just get this absolutely abundantly clear that what you will be doing is stopping people below a threshold of £30,000 from coming to the United Kingdom and that will mainly be what you call people with lower skills and young people at the beginning of their careers. Is that roughly the understanding of what you're trying to achieve by ending freedom of movement? No, what I'm, what I'm what we're doing is delivering on the vote that took place. Uh, ending free movement, I believe, was a key issue for many people here in the United Kingdom. Uh, and we will be ending free movement, we'll bring an end to free movement. What this will enable us to do is to put into place an immigration system which applies to the whole of uh, you know, the world outside the United Kingdom. Up until now, we've been able to have immigration rules for countries outside the EU, but not for countries inside the EU. We will be able to have a single immigration system that covers all of those. Uh, we asked the Independent Migration Advisory Committee to look into this issue, um, to consider the shape and form that such an immigration system could, should take, taking into account the requirements of the UK economy. They did that, and their proposal was that rather than having a tier two cap, a number set, uh, which we've had up till now for outside the European Union, we should move to a skills-based system. Uh, and the uh, with the proposed salary threshold, uh, which would determine well, those, uh, that's determine really, those that's really, really helpful, but it's a reciprocal agreement. So what we do to European Union nationals, they will do to us. So that means that people with most skills from the United Kingdom, young people at the beginning of their careers, will equally not be allowed the same rights of access to the European Union. Uh, no. Well, first of all, you've uh, jumped to an assumption there. Uh, what I was talking about was the immigration system that will be independently put into place by but, the United but, but Kingdom my government. Is, Europe will you do have... to us what we do to well, them. Is you're that making correct? an assumption. You, you. I have to say, I don't think that the. Uh, there's so, been not, you, so you're expecting. Yet you're expecting the, the young uh, Brits to go abroad as they have just now. Without... Well, we've we've been looking at a variety of uh, a variety of issues uh, in relation to uh, young people particularly. One of the areas that we've looked at is the sort of programmes such as Erasmus, which uh, have enabled the uh, you know, students to take advantage of membership of the European Union. But if you look at the, uh, the uh, section within the political declaration, you will see that, of course, uh, we will be looking at uh, mo the, the mobility uh, arrangements that are in isn't any it, isn't trade it the case, agreement? Prime Minister, that the rights that you and I had to live, work and love across a continent of 28 nations is going to be deprived to our young people because of your obsession with immigration? No. And I refer you to Article 53. The parties agree to consider conditions... ...in trying to get the best deal possible for our country. Nobody could have worked harder than you. <laughs> Um, can I ask you firstly what plans you have to govern in the event that you win the vote on the 21st of December, given that you will be doing so without the DUP? Uh, well, that is, again, there are a lot of questions which are based on assumptions. Um, the, uh, we uh, obviously are talking to the DUP as we are talking to other members of Parliament about the vote that will take place on, uh, the, uh, on the 11th of December. But nevertheless, you have to plan for the worst case scenario, and it's highly likely, given the remarks made by Arlene Foster, uh, that you will be facing the future without uh, your confidence and supply partner. No. The, uh, actually, the DUP have themselves said that the confidence and supply agreement remains in place. 
the, I saw Eileen Foster and other representatives from the DUP, as I did Sinn Féin, Alliance, SDLP and the UUP when I was in Northern Ireland on Tuesday. And we discussed, yes, the concerns that the DUP have raised with the, some of the arrangements that are in the withdrawal agreement. And obviously there are some issues which, uh, uh, with which they're concerned, which fall to the UK government as a sovereign decision to consider our, our response to. So if you win on the, tw on the uh, 11th of December, you expect the DEP to continue much as they are at the moment in the, their support? As I say, they have said themselves that the Competence and Supply Agreement remains in place. Can you name a, a single trade agreement outside the Eurasian Customs Union that does not allow a party to the agreement to withdraw on notice other than the one proposed in the withdrawal agreement? Sorry, can I name a single trade, do you say trade? Trade arrangement. Have, trade arrangement. That, uh, well, anywhere in the world which doesn't allow one party, party, party to withdraw on giving sufficient notice. There is, the, obviously, what we have here in the withdrawal agreement is an agreement which sets out the arrangements for us leaving the European Union. And within that, the backstop, uh, the protocol for Northern Ireland, which ensures that at all stages, if it is the case that the future relationship is not in place, we are able to uh, get, com continue to meet our guarantee to the people of Northern Ireland that there will be no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Within the uh, withdrawal agreement, it is set out there are ways in which it is possible to end that backstop. Obviously, the best way is not to use it in the first place. The second is to get into the future relationship. There are alternative. It doesn't have to be used, even when we haven't got the future relationship in place in time. Um, but there are, uh, we can ensure that there are arrangements in place. The key here is always ensuring that uh, through the sure. arrangements that we see in the withdrawal agreement, prior to the future relationship coming into place, yeah. which deals with this, that we deal with the commitment on but we cannot But we cannot unilaterally right. withdraw from this arrangement. There, is, there isn't a unilateral withdrawal clause, but if you think about the nature of the insurance policy that the backstop is, um, this is about ensuring and committing to the people of Northern Ireland uh, that there will be no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Yeah. And that means that in the circumstances where the future relationship, which would deal with that, the future relationship is not in place, mm. uh, the question is, what then comes in? As you know, there's the, the, what's come to be known as the backstop, there's sure. the extension of the IP, there's possibility of alternative arrangements. All of those, clearly, from the withdrawal agreement, would only be temporary. Yes, that's, all, that's all understood, Prime Minister, and is well laid out. Uh, do you share my worry that the backstop protocol is a bit like a post-war prefab? It's sold as temporary, it's built to last, and it's likely to outlive us all. <laughs> No, I don't. <laughs> and, uh, and there are a number of reasons why I don't. First of all, uh, there, there are many, as you will see, there are a number of references throughout the withdrawal agreement that indicate that this is only temporary. Um, uh, one of those, of course, is the uh, issue about Article 50, which cannot in itself, as a legal base, uh, lead to a permanent relationship. Um, but the, the, it is also, it's not just the, what's in the withdrawal agreement, but actually, the, if you look at the backstop, neither side thinks that the backstop is a good place to be in. Sure. The United Kingdom is worried about the implications uh, in, of the backstop, yeah. but the European Union is worried about the implications of the backstop as well. Do you think, if we President don't, for example, in the backstop, if we don't, if we haven't agreed an agreement for <coughs> um, access to fishing waters, mm. which by definition almost certainly wouldn't have been because the future relation, if you're in the backstop, you haven't got the future relationship and that agreement would be in the future relationship, then the European Union would have no access to UK waters, fishing you, you, waters. You, you've anticipated my question because I was going to ask you uh, what you felt about President Macron's comments because he clearly doesn't agree about the temporary nature of the backstop or indeed his ability to secure more advantages from the United Kingdom uh, if we came to the point at which we wish to, uh, to remove ourselves from the arrangement. Well, as I, as I think I said the other day, I think um, it would be good for President Macron and others to um, perhaps recall the position that would apply in the backstop, which I've, is the one that I've just set out, which if there is no agreement on access to, uh, to waters, and that agreement, of course, is part of the future relationship, the, the agreement of how we negotiate those access to waters, if that is not in place, which by definition, if you're in the backstop, it wouldn't be, because if it's in the future relationship, uh, 
he wouldn't be in the backstop if the future relationship was it was in place, uh, then there would be no access to UK waters. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, if if we if you lose on the 11th of December, would you consider going back to the European Union and suggesting that the time limit to the backstop? Uh, that was being negotiated in the summer and still being talked about in Dublin, for example, uh, might be inserted, which is likely to get it over the line for a number of colleagues and might just about get this uh, through the House of Commons. Do you think that's a possibility if you lose on the 11th of December? Well, the, there's, uh, the temporary nature of the backstop is, is within the withdrawal agreement. Uh, at no stage was uh, there... Uh, any indication that a set time limit for the backstop could be in the withdrawal agreement. Uh, what stops the backstop is the future relationship or alternative arrangements being put in place that enable us to continue to guarantee, give our guarantee to the people of, uh, of Northern Ireland for the, uh, for the future, uh, for the uh, no hard border. And indeed, um, you know, the European Union has made clear that there's no deal without a, a backstop. Um, and, I mean, the, the, the tea shop just a couple of days ago made the point that you, you can't... I mean, he was talking about he wouldn't speculate on no deal. You can't, you can't avoid a hard border just through goodwill, political statements and wishful thinking. Actually, you need to have the uh, agreements in place that enable that to take place. Thank you. Um, Dr. Julian Lewis. Prime Minister, everybody knows that the prospect of a so-called hard border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic has been a crucial factor in forcing us to stay in a customs union. So please tell us, under what circumstances could a hard border be erected between Northern Ireland and the <coughs> Irish Republic? Well, first of all, if I may, uh, Dr. Lewis, the, we are not being for, the, the, the statement being forced to stay in a customs union might imply to some who are listening that that is going to be the long-term permanent relationship of the United Kingdom with the European Union. It is not. This is a temporary arrangement for uh, until the future relationship is in place. It need never happen. Right. Can we can we in a stick to my question though? Under yes, what I'm circumstances could a hard border be erected between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic? The circumstances in which we have said that we would do everything in our that. power that to not to exercise, not to uh, have a hard border, <laughs> but we are not the only party to this, uh, to this arrangement. Yeah. Uh, the, obviously there is the Irish government, in fact competence in this is a matter for the European Union. As I've just said, uh, as the Taoiseach has made clear, well, sometimes it's said to me, well everybody says they won't have a hard border. But as he's, the point he's made is, is you can't rely. You know, so, he's Prime saying, Minister, don't you can't just rely on political statements for a hard, no hard border. You have to actually have the arrangements in place that enable no hard border to uh, be erected. Prime Minister, you still haven't answered the question. Under what circumstances could a hard border be erected, or are there no circumstances under which a hard border would be erected? For example, if we leave on 29th of March without a deal, and I know you don't want us to, and you're doing everything to avoid our leaving without a deal, but if we do, would there have to be a hard uh, I'm afraid we just have a little interruption in that broadcast live from Westminster. Theresa May uh, giving evidence to MPs there about her Brexit agenda. I think we may just have it back. We could not to erect a hard border. All right. But there would be a decision from the European Union and the Irish government. And the concern that, uh, that they would have would be about the fact that we would then be right. in a different right. set of circumstances on customs right. you're, you're and so gonna, And how not, do you check those? You're not going to tell me any specific circumstances, but do you accept that there are some circumstances under which a hard border might have to be erected? Well, that's Because otherwise, what are we worried yeah, about? Well, that, that, the, the, that's the point. The point is that because you cannot guarantee that there will be no hard border right. in all circumstances okay. unless we have put in the arrangements to ensure there is no hard border. Right, well let's, let's assume, because things don't always work out the way we want them to work out, let's assume that we're in some scenario whereby a hard border needed to be erected. Now who would, under those circumstances, whatever they may be, who would insist on a hard border actually being built if, for example, we leave with no deal in place, who would insist on a hard border being built if 
people felt a hard border has to be built. Would the UK, under any circumstances, insist on putting in a hard border? Would the Irish Republic, on any, under any circumstances, insist on putting in a hard border? Or would the EU itself, in any circumstances, insist on putting in a hard border? Well, I can only speak for the UK government, mm -hmm. and I have made clear that if there is, if we leave the European Union in a no-deal scenario, mm -hmm. we will do everything in our power to avoid there being a hard border. Right. So, let's assume then that, in circumstances unspecified, somebody is insisting that there must be a hard border. Who would actually build it? Would the UK build it? Would the Irish Republic build it? Or would the EU build it? Now, I asked you this question on the 17th of October, but you didn't answer it. You merely stated, we are all working to ensure there will be no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. So please answer it now. Who would physically put this hard border in place? We certainly wouldn't. The Irish certainly wouldn't. And how could the EU possibly do it if neither of us were going to do so? Oh. The, first of all, again, you have asked, I can only speak for the United Kingdom government in these, uh, in these matters. And we have said that we would do everything to avoid there being a hard border on the, uh, between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Uh, others, decisions for the other parties in this are decisions for them, yes, not for me. But if they took those decisions, Prime Minister, they would find it impossible to implement because we would not build it for them, and the Irish wouldn't build it for them. So unless they're anticipating sending in the EU army to build it for them, it would never be built. So the whole thing amounts, does it not, to an excuse to keep us entangled with the European Union for fear of building a border that is never going to happen under any scenario whatsoever. No, That's the truth. No, it is it? not. And I, dis I do disagree with that. So what are the I disagree with that. And I think it is important. And if I may just address this point, there's this assumption or this, this sort of point that is made that somehow this question of the hard border in Northern Ireland is a matter that has been pushed on the United Kingdom government uh, by the European Union and or the government of the Republic of Ireland. It is not. We have a commitment to the people of Northern Ireland. They are part of the United Kingdom. I want them to be able to continue to lead their lives very much as they do today when we leave the European Union. Not having a hard border uh, and enabling businesses to operate as they do today is an important part of that commitment that we have made. And if I may refer again to the remarks that the Taoiseach made, uh, what I will say is that you can't avoid a hard border just through goodwill, political statements and wishful thinking. So who would so put it, it is up? Important, it is important for who us to recognise that we have a commitment to the people of Northern Ireland. Now, I believe that commitment is best met, as does the Taoiseach, as does the European Union, through the future relationship we are going to have with the, uh, with the European Union. That is why it's important that we, uh, uh, that we have within the withdrawal agreement the commitments for both sides using their best endeavours to ensure that relationship is in place by the end of December 2020. So there is no question of a backstop, no question of an extension to an implementation period, no question of alternative arrangements because they are in, it, it is dealt with in the future I relationship. I have to stop now but I can only just note you have not shown who would physically erect it and the answer is no. Right, we're going to move on now to Yvette Cooper. Prime Minister, I know that you do rightly care about the um, nor risks to Northern Ireland security. You also care immensely about and know about the security risks to the country and the economic risks to the country if there is no deal. So knowing you for 20 years, I just don't believe that if your deal goes down, you are the kind of person who would contemplate taking this country into a no-deal situation. Am I wrong? The decision, it will be a decision for Parliament as to whether they accept the deal that I and the Government have negotiated on behalf of the, Euro of the United Kingdom with the European Union. I believe that's a good deal for the United Kingdom. I understand, and I don't want to go no, over those previous answers. Is it, my, it, my issue is, I don't believe you are the kind of person who could contemplate no deal, even if you don't get this deal, I don't think you'll do it. I think you'll take action to avert it. Am I'm, I wrong in my judgment about you? I'm, well, I've had a number of questions now about what happens if. What I'm saying is very simple. 
uh, my focus is on the vote that okay. takes place on December the 11th. That's fine. I was asking actually about I've whether... You, the, because oh. I've negotiated what I believe truly to be a good deal for the UK. Okay, and, and I understand all of that. On the vote. The, I was asking you about the kind of person that I, I think you are, but let me just then go into the specifics of the deal. Uh, can you confirm we don't have access agreed to the CIS2 database or the ECRIS database in the political declaration? We don't have... Uh, the CIS2 database and the ECRIS database specifically identified in the um, in the uh, political declaration. And you pushed for those we, as well. What we what we do have is a reference to exchange of information on in wanted or missing persons, sure. objects, and of criminal records, <laughs> which that's... of course are what CIS2 and ECRIS covers. But you've tried to the get nature. a specific reference. You have got reference to PRUM, you have got reference to PNR. So you've achieved some access to some <coughs> specific things, but you haven't got access to those, but your security assessment assumes that you have. I mean, that is not being straight with people about the risks to security of what you've currently got in your political declaration and in your agreement. Well, the, but what the political declaration makes clear is that as part of the, the future negotiations, the nature of the access to those uh, 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 on that data exchange will be part of the future uh, negotiations, but it is with a view to delivering um, capabilities that insofar as is technically and legally possible and considered necessary, and parties okay. consider it necessary, and in both parties' interests. But it, but it doesn't say those enabled by, But this is, this is about whether or not we have the capability or whether or not we're in a okay. specific But you're, you're still measure. channeling around this. You haven't got agreement to it, and it is a risk. You know how important it is. Let me ask you specifically about borders and customs. When he says in paragraph 23, we're going to build and improve on the single customs territory, does that mean alignment to the common external tariff? No, because it goes on as uh, what it makes absolutely clear, that it's in line with the party's objectives and principles above, which includes us being an independent, uh, able to have an independent trade policy. Okay, so if we don't have alignment to the common external tariff, why did you tell Parliament on Monday that we've got an agreement to no rules of origins checks? That is within the, uh, if you look within the uh, text of the political declaration, you will see the, uh, I'm just finding it's the... It's paragraph 23. 23. What it says is, build and improve on the single customs territory provided for in the withdrawal agreement, which includes alignment to the common external tariff, which obviates the need for checks on rules of origin. Yes. So you're reference to the checks for rules of origins is only in the context of the single <coughs> customs territory which includes no. the alignment to the common external tariff no the the uh, if you think back to that it is wrong to assume that the only way to obviate the needs for rules of origin checks is for the united kingdom to be uh, uh, only able to ex uh, to apply the common external tariff that is not the case what's the other what, way well, the government published a white paper in July that showed the uh, showed another way of uh, doing oh, this. So you've gone back to checkers. The you've government gone back to the checkers agreement. Yes. So this is the the, the max facts or the customs partnership and stuff that we know the EU has rejected. No, the the, you know, the European <coughs> Union, one of the key elements of the political declaration is that the European Union did start off from the position of saying that there were no arrangements <coughs> that would be available to the United Kingdom other than the what come to be in shorthand the Norway model or the Canada model, uh, and Canada only for GB. Uh, in fact, what they have now accepted is that there is, you know, the United Kingdom will have a different relationship with the European Union, an unprecedented relationship with the European Union, because we will not just be any third country. And that means that we're looking for an ambition in our customs arrangement, which is set out within the political declaration, is made very yeah, but you're clear still only in this on political ambition. I mean, here's your, your problem is you're trying to say to some people that you're going to get a frictionless trade, you're going to be pretty close to Norway. You're trying to say to other people you're going to be pretty close to Canada and you're going to have a free and independent trade policy. Actually, you haven't got agreement to any of those. And in your head, you're just resting on checkers and your uh, max facts thing that's already being rejected. So once again, you're just not being straight with people. And isn't your real problem here that because you haven't got agreement to any of this, because it is still a spectrum, as your own documents say, 
actually you're really saying to people, trust me, I'll sort it out in the second phase, but because you're not being straight with people on any of these things, on CIS2, on whether or not we're going to be poorer, on whether or not we're going to have rules of origins checks, <coughs> actually you're not able to build up that trust? Well, uh, first of all, uh, you said that none of the what I had said was uh, had been agreed and was in the political declaration, including the fact that we will have an independent trade policy. It is specifically referenced in the political declaration. It was important for the United Kingdom that we have got that reference into the political declaration, that the European Union accepts that we will have an independent trade policy outside of the European Union. That is a major... The, the, the assumptions around... Obviously, there's been a lot of talk about whether it would be better to stay in the customs union, which, of course, would not enable us to have that independent trade policy. And the, uh, the, the model, as you say, at one end of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the uh, two, one of the two models that the European Union originally started off thinking that we would need to have, would have uh, required that. It would also not have ended free movement. But what the, we the have, problem is you haven't got any of have, this pinned no, down. Yes, what we have in this political declaration is agreements on the... Uh, yes, as I've been, I was clear about the fact in relation to frictionless, absolutely frictionless as opposed to as near frictionless as possible. But we've got agreement in relation to no tariffs, fees, charges or quantitative restrictions across all sectors. Um, and this is, and it, what is also clear in this, is that the next stage gives effect to this relationship. Prime Minister, I don't think you're adding anything. I think it's Tom Tugendhat's turn. I'm going to move on to Tom Tugendhat. Prime Minister, <laughs> thank you very much for your point so far, and I recognise your uh, unwillingness to predict an un, uh, a questionable future. Could we at least look at a certain past and ask, what have you learnt from these negotiations, given that we're now only about halfway through anyway? Um, I suppose, <coughs> I'm not sure it's something that I've learnt specifically from these negotiations, because obviously I'm in, was involved in certain negotiations with the EU when I was Home Secretary. I think what has been reinforced by these negotiations is that actually if we are rigorous and robust in our defence of our position, then we can change the uh, view in the European Union. Um, I think one of the best examples of that is what I've just been talking about. They started off saying you can only be Norway or Canada for GB, but actually now they've accepted an ambitious customs relationship, a trade relationship that is beyond anything that any other uh, advanced economy has with them. You've made that point before, and uh, I, I, it's noticeable that they have moved on some areas. Surely there are some things that you would now, having conducted some of the most complex negotiations this country has conducted in peacetime, there are some things that you would do differently were you to be in 2016 today. Well, the, no, as I say, I think the, if you look at the negotiations, the, the, the lesson that can be taken from it is that it's, and it's, it's not just, I think, Sometimes people look at negotiations as, as sort of great um, theatre pieces. I think what we've seen from the work that has been done, that actually the way that you get through and the way that you get change is through patient and painstaking argument on the issues and on the detail of the issues. I would certainly agree with you that the detail is the fundament of what you're arguing, hence the 585 pages we've all had the privilege to read over the last few weeks. Um, but surely some of this is to do with the structure as well. And there must be some elements of the structure that you may feel that you wish to do differently. For example, the fact that David Davis appears to have only been in Brussels for a few days to negotiate with Barnier does rather question whether or not a Brexit department was the right way to go or whether it would have been better to bring the levers of foreign influence under the Foreign Office or indeed under you and through the Cabinet Office? Well, of course, there has been, I mean, there's, uh, I think it was absolutely right to set up the Department for Exiting the European Union um, because there are different, there are a number of functions that that department is undertaking. And crucially, of course, one of the uh, things that the department has been doing is looking at the preparedness for all scenarios, preparedness for deal and preparedness for no deal. And that is something that's been led by that department. Of course, uh, negotiations were always going to be uh, across government. There have been other departments involved in negotiations where the, it has been a specific, an issue specific to those departments. So it was never the case in these negotiations, and it won't be in the future negotiations, that it's just one person <coughs> against one person. Actually, it takes a lot of work streams and a lot of people across uh, departments being involved in, in it. The reason I ask is because there are a few moments that frankly have left me somewhat surprised. Certainly seeing you walking out of the meeting in Salzburg 
where to see the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom surprised at the outcome of one of the most important talks uh, that has been conducted on behalf of this nation did raise certain questions as to whether or not the Foreign Office had prepared its advice properly, whether the advice had been fed through properly, or whether it had been fully uh, taken on board. And what the Permanent Under Secretary of State, uh, Sir Simon MacDonald, said the other day to our committee was that the advice had been prepared properly. So why were uh, you apparently surprised by the reaction of the European leaders? And does this suggest that there is a better way of coordinating for the next stage of the talks? Well, I think the, the, it, it is certainly I have no complaint with the advice that was, uh, that was given by the Foreign Office or indeed by the, all the others that were involved in this. I think all I would say is that there are sometimes moments in these negotiations um, where particular, a particular position is taken and we, you know, in any negotiation, either side, when the other side takes a position, has a decision to take as to how to react to that. And I felt it was right to react in the way that I did. And at the last point, if I may, the Brexit Department has clearly got a very different role today to the one envisaged when it was set up, as it's now in reality the, the Department for No Deal. Does this mean that you'll be looking to change some of the civil servants from uh, diplomats involved in trade negotiations to uh, home affairs, uh, health, transport and others more involved in domestic policy to focus on preparing the United Kingdom for a No Deal rather than preparing us uh, for the negotiations? Well, the, the, the job that DEXU is doing is preparing for, yes, it has a role in, has a role in, does have a role in preparing for no deal, but it also has a role in preparing for a deal. But it's not that you need all the expertise in DEXU. Actually, they do work, and they have been bringing uh, civil servants from across departments with particular areas of expertise into DEXU to look to be dealing with these issues. But uh, the, obviously, it works with other departments as well. So if you look at a department like DEFRA, um, they have had, because they're the department probably most affected in legislative terms, in terms of numbers of pieces of legislation uh, for, uh, uh, the, with the EU, um, they have themselves obviously been doing a lot of the work involved in uh, preparedness. DEXU has an overall responsibility for that and ensuring that the cross-governmental activity is undertaken in a way that works and also that the, the work of one department isn't inadvertently um, uh, you know, affecting uh, the work of another department. So could I just finally clarify, so despite the fact that we've gone through the most complex divorce talks that any uh, country has been through, and despite the fact that we're about to enter the most complex um, marriage negotiations through this free trade agreement that we're hoping to negotiate with the, uh, with the European Union, there is no stage at which you'd wish to change either the Yenta or the structure in which the uh, marriage broker uh, organises herself. Well, I, I, I think, I'm not sure that a remarriage is perhaps the correct analogy for uh, the uh, relationship that there's going to be in the future. We're going to be very good friends and working closely, uh, working closely friends together. Friends with benefits? Uh, the, <laughs> sorry? <laughs> I, do, I missed your quip, I'm sorry. Friends with benefits, Prime Minister. <laughs> um, the, uh, but, uh, but obviously we look, uh, as we go through this process, we will continue to look, as we have been, because as you, you probably know, we've made some changes over the summer, to DEXU, to the relative roles of DEXU in the Cabinet Office. So we have, throughout this process, we look to make sure that we have the right people in the right place uh, and with the right you know, ministerial responsibilities and so forth <coughs> for the Thank task you, in hand. Well, on that happy note, we're going to move on to Transport, Science and Health, <coughs> Prime Minister, starting with Norman Mayer. Thank you. Can you just confirm that we will definitely have the immigration white paper published before the meaningful vote on the 11th of December? Uh, the, there is still discussion ongoing as to the timing of the uh, immigration But do you white see paper. that it's really important that it's published before the meaningful vote? And can you guarantee that that will happen? Well, the, the, what the uh, immigration I mean, white I mean, it's just, just you're expecting people to vote for your deal, but, and, and bearing in mind the political declaration, surely we need to know what you have in mind for the immigration rules of this country before we vote on the 11th of December. Well, we've set out, in, obviously set out the outline of the uh, immigration rules that we... Our immigration policy is a separate policy decision. Good morning, it's sure. 10 o'clock, you're watching we'll Sky we'll News. The we'll Prime Minister we'll is giving evidence I, I, to the I, I, liaison I committee of select committee chairman in the Commons uh, on the subject of Brexit. Uh, all out politics will follow this live evidence the session. He says that access to the best people is, in a sense, their most important priority in these negotiations. Can you guarantee that no obstacles will be put in the way of recruiting the best people from the EU and indeed from the rest of the world? 
Well, I would hope that the um, uh, science community would see that the benefit of moving from, uh, would see themselves the benefit of moving to an immigration system that is skills based. Uh, and uh, which is obviously the... the but no obstacles in the way uh, compared to what they have at the moment because this is really important for them. Well, I'm not entirely clear what sort of obstacles you think well, if, they have at the moment. Well, if the same rules the applied to the rest of the, as do to the rest of the world, to the EU, there would be enormous obstacles in the way. They need to be able to recruit the best people without bureaucratic obstacles <coughs> placed in the way. Well, th there will always be a process for people to access uh, people from out. So it will be more difficult than it is at the moment? No, no, I didn't say that, sorry. Uh, uh, because at the moment they can recruit from within the EU without any obstacles. That's going to be more difficult. No, they, they will be, there will be, obviously, if we're looking at an immigration system that is across the whole of the world, uh, and an immigration system that is skills-based, then it will be necessary for there to be a process for people to go through when they're recruiting from any, somebody from whatever part of the world. But you see how important it is for that to be as simple as yes. possible. Yes. Now, you've talked about a far-reaching science and innovation pact and then subsequently an accord, but it's not referred to specifically in the political declaration. Can you confirm that that's still your intention to negotiate that far-reaching accord? Because that's really important. We are, I mean, if you look back to the speech I first gave in Lancaster House, yeah. I think you will see... That's when you that mentioned it, but it's not science, in the political declaration. Sci science and innovation are, uh, were one of the areas where we do want to ensure that we continue to have that good relationship. Now, at the time I talked about it, whether that is uh, referenced in an accord or uh, whether it is in some uh, other form that we ensure that good science, that good relationship, is a matter, but it is one of the issues that we will be taking forward. But can you confirm absolutely that we will be part of Horizon Europe, the funding system? That, that is, well, it is, it, as I understand, it is possible for third countries to be part of Horizon. It is, but... It, it's, um, the, 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 what the political declaration makes clear is that we haven't negotiated the terms on which it would be possible for the specific So you can't say now whether we will be part of it or not? Well, because this is, uncertainty is really damaging. They need to know whether they will be part of this vital funding system for science. What we need to look at when we come to the legal text and the negotiations on the legal text is, of course, the terms on which uh, being part of that for the United, would be possible for the United Kingdom. But what's the time scale? Whether How long is this be, going to take? Whether those would be within the, uh, the arrangements that are currently for a third country or whether those would be different for the United Kingdom. So no, no detail on when this is going to be agreed and, whether we know, and when we will know whether we will, we will be part of Horizon Europe? The, it will be part of the uh, negotiations that will be taking place in terms of the legal text but, uh, uh, post the... Uh, and obviously there's, a, there's, a, there's elements of preparatory work that will be done before the 29th of March. The legal text can't be uh, determined and agreed until after the 29th of March. Now, on the European Medicines Agency, uh, Jeremy Hunt, uh, when he was uh, Health Secretary, said that uh, we will continue to work very closely with the EMA, but in the political declaration, all it says is we will explore the possibility of cooperation with agencies such as the EMA much looser. <coughs> Can you give any, any indication as to whether it is your intention want to do is to negotiate a relationship that ensures that we are able to operate in, in relation to the EMA in a way that is suitable for the United Kingdom for the future. Now, but is it your intention? Is, well, the question is whether or not the EMA does not have third country examples of, of membership, um, unlike EASA, which of course does. So there's a model in EASA which we believe um, could be the basis for a model for the EMA. Um, but that is that will be part of the negotiations, exactly what that relationship is, whether it is in that sort of, if you like, third country membership, whether it is some <coughs> other form of access in, a, in legal form. That is the, the, the discussion that still has to take place. I mean, I think a lot of people will be worried that on all of this, there seems to be complete uncertainty with no indication as to when we will know what the deal will be. Well, the, it was always going to be the case that the legal text 
could not be agreed and, and determined until we had left the European Union. Um, and, and that is the, the, uh, the case. That was always going to be the case. Uh, what we have in the political declaration is the set of instructions, if you like, to the negotiators for the future uh, to put into place and give effect to what is in the political declaration. Now, what I'm saying to you is the precise form in which that relationship takes place is one that will be part of the, the, the uh, next set of negotiations. Thank you. Thank you. Can we move on to Lillian Greenwood? Uh, good morning, uh, Prime morning. Minister. Um, I think whilst we want to focus primarily on contingency planning, I did want to just clarify uh, one point which you've just referred to. In July, you told us that you wanted the UK to continue to participate uh, in the European Aviation Safety Agency as a non-EU member state. The political declaration refers only to close cooperation between the Civil Aviation Authority and the ARSA. Can you explain the reason for that discrepancy? Yes, it, it's because the uh, precise nature and legal form that will take place, that will take uh, for the cooperation and for our relationship with the IASA is something that will be agreed and negotiated when the legal text is put together in the next stage of the negotiations. As I say, it was always going to be the case that the legal uh, uh, text would be negotiated after we left the European Union. Uh, the chief executive of the Civil Aviation Authority, the then chief executive of the CAA, told the Transport Committee in very emphatic terms that full membership was the right thing to do, if at all possible. Yeah. Um, so when you produced the political declaration, did you not listen to the regulator and the industry, or have the negotiations failed to include that ambition of full membership for the UK? No, the form in which the cooperation that the CAA will have with, you, with EASA um, is one which obviously we've agreed that that will be a close cooperation which will ensure high standards of aviation safety. The question is exactly what the legal arrangements would be. That's a matter for the next phase of negotiations. Um, what, but I, I think what is important in, in a number of these areas is that we can either look at this in terms of um, maintaining the exact structures that, that exist today or maintaining the capabilities that exist today. And sometimes it's possible to maintain capabilities but in a different way from the exact structures that exist today. So I'm not sure that I'm quite clear. Is, is it still your ambition for the UK to be a full member of EASA as recommended by everyone in the aviation industry, including the government, including the UK regulator? It, is, it continues to be our, uh, our intention to argue for the closest possible relationship with EASA. Now, that would be membership of, uh, membership of EASA for, in the interests of, of aviation security what I'm, and safe, aviation safety. What I'm, but what I'm saying is that I think that there will be, I'm not saying this is one of them, but there may be a number of areas, the number of areas have been uh, relate, referenced that uh, where membership or a particular relationship is not identified in the political declaration, but there will be areas where the question will be how do we ensure that the capabilities that are required can be maintained in the future? I think there's a, there's a, a huge difference between us being members uh, and us having close cooperation. If uh, the, the chief executive of the CA was very clear that if we are not able to have membership, which he described as uh, a worst case scenario, uh, that we might have to develop a, a, an EASA compliant regime. But wouldn't that make us rule takers rather than being a really important and influential uh, voice at the table as we are now? Well, we want to continue to ensure that we are able to have that influential voice. As I say, the legal form that our relationship takes in the future will be one that has to be negotiated after we've left the EU. I think some of my constituents would like Brexit to be over and uh, done with. Um, wouldn't they be right to understand that no matter what hap whatever happens on the 11th uh, of December, it won't be, even if your deal is successfully uh, ratified by Parliament and that we know what the mathematics uh, are, it is the case that Brexit will not be over and done with because there will be at least another two years 
of ongoing negotiations about EASA and a whole range of other things. Isn't it important that the public know that? The, the, there will be ongoing negotiations, but we, we will have left the European Union. We will no longer be a member of the European Union because we will cease to be a member of the European Union on the 29th of March next year. <laughs> I, th I think it's important that they understand that will not be the, even if that happens, that will not be the end uh, of discussions about Brexit because, as you've acknowledged, there are many, many mm. important matters the, the, that are not secure. The, the, the negotiations on the legal text of that future relationship um, cannot take place until we are no longer a member of the European Union. So we will be continuing to negotiate on, on those matters, but we will not be a member of the European Union. So we'd be out so without the leverage to negotiate what we want? No, we'll be out, but we will be negotiating on the basis of a political declaration that has set out clearly what we want. Apart from, in, it doesn't actually say anything about membership of a very important uh, European safety agency that has huge implications for our aviation and aerospace sectors. What it does is recognise that we will continue to have a relationship in order to ensure high standards of aviation, security, uh, aviation safety. And that's what I think, I think the public will want to know, that we're going to be able to continue to ensure aviation safety. Turning to contingency, uh, in July the National Audit Office said that the Department for Transport faces a considerable challenge in preparing for Brexit and yesterday the Public Accounts Committee said there's a real risk the Department for Transport won't be ready in the event of the UK departing the EU without a negotiated deal. Why is that department, the Department for Transport not ready? Well, the Department of Transport has been putting a number of elements of uh, preparation in place. It is one of the departments that has had legislation going through the House, for example, in preparation for these, uh, for these uh, all scenarios. But, they're clear, but we, we heard that they're not ready. How will you make sure that that department, and indeed all others, are brought <coughs> back on track? Oh, that the work that the uh, Secretary of State for Exiting the European Union is doing in bringing together the departments in looking at the preparedness. This is looked at constantly, uh, both preparedness for deal, preparedness for no deal. As I say, there have been various elements of the, the preparations that have needed to be put in place, including elements in relation to Parliament. I think we, we remain concerned that time is ticking and things are not ready. Thank you, Thank Chair. You. Um, Prime Minister, can I ask, are you concerned about the scale of the challenges that will face the NHS and, and, and most importantly, patients in the event that we do crash out with no deal in, and no transition in 120 days? Well, I'm, I'm uh, you know, Chairman, I'm presenting a good deal to Parliament, which I hope I know, that Parliament will recognise as a good I, deal but and just will understand that. To, to but the Department for things. Health and... Sorry. I just wanted to come back to that opening, the, my opening comments that given the parliamentary arithmetic, it does look increasingly likely that, that we could crash out with no deal. And, and given the scale of the consequences for patients, we're looking at supplies of critical medicines, medical products and devices, um, many areas where they can't be um, uh, stockpiled, for example, because they have a very short shelf life, complex <coughs> biologicals. There are so many patients that will face very serious disruption to essential supplies and medicines. Is that keeping you awake at night? I'm ensuring that I mean, the Department of Health and Social Care is obviously doing a lot of work in this area. But I, I, I do come back and they are looking at what is necessary in uh, were it the circumstances of a no deal. But of course, the, 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 way, one, you know, the way to ensure that we get the good deal and yes. that we are able to see that smooth and orderly exit from the European Union when we leave on the 29th of March next year is to ratify the deal that the government has <laughs> negotiated can with I, the European can I Union. Can just take you back to a point that Yvette Cooper made earlier? Could any responsible government allow the scale of chaos that would ensue if we had no deal and no transition? Would, could any responsible government allow that? Could you allow that to happen, I, Prime Minister? I think the role of a responsible government in these circumstances <coughs> is to ensure that government is prepared for uh, any scenario that, uh, that all scenarios that uh, um, develop and to ensure that where there are potential difficulties, that those are mitigated uh, as to the greatest extent possible. That's the work that's being done by DEXU and by departments across government in relation to this issue.
Yes, it, I accept that contingency planning is now happening to try and mitigate it, but, but would you accept that there would still be serious consequences um, for patients if we were to leave with no deal, and could you allow that to happen? The Department of Health and Social Care is putting in place arrangements to ensure that in those circumstances, yes. it would still be possible for people to access the medicines that uh, are required. But do you accept that that I mean, wouldn't the, happen for everybody? Sorry, do I accept? Do you accept that that wouldn't happen for everybody, though, Prime Minister? Even with um, good contingency planning, which is happening rather belatedly, um, that there would be patients that would be seriously impacted by shortages of essential supplies of medicines and devices? Well, the whole point of the work that the DHSC is doing is to ensure that uh, those okay. medicines and, and devices are available in all circumstances. If, if they advise you that they won't be, uh, and that you receive advice that, uh, that there will be uh, disruption, in spite of careful planning, uh, would you give us your assurance that you wouldn't allow us to crash out with no deal if that would cause serious disruption to, to patients? Well, the, the um, <coughs> decision that is going to be taken on December the 11th by members of the House of Commons is what is pertinent in this, in relation to this. That decision will be about whether to accept a deal, which but is a good deal for the United Kingdom, which enables that smooth and orderly. Well, because um, a, a point that is little focused on, but is relevant, particularly relevant in relation to these matters, is that the withdrawal agreement, of course, sets up the implementation period. And it is that implementation period Indeed. that allows that orderly exit from the European Union. Right, but the, I'm afraid the, the parliamentary arithmetic is such that it looks as if that isn't going to pass the Commons. Can, can I ask, in your letter to the nation, you refer to the £394 million a week um, to the NHS. Could you confirm for me that that £394 million a week would happen whatever happens um, on the 11th, that uh, if we have no Brexit or indeed we have um, your, your future arrangements, uh, would we still have that £394 million well, a week? The government has made a commitment to right. the National Health Service and to uh, the funding of the National Health Service. We set that out in the budget. So, uh, in, uh, we set that out in the budget in October. So in what, I am, what I am working for, and I think anybody, if anybody is concerned about these matters, that this is another reason for focusing on the deal no, that is being negotiated Minister, with the my, European Union. Could I just stop you there, Prime Minister, because my question to you is, would it happen irrespective of the deal? Is that, is that promise still in place? We have, made, we have made that commitment to the National Health Service. Uh, but I think in relation to these, all of the other matters that you're talking about, Chairman, this is, this is a point of focus at the, on the December the 11th, no, when no. members of Parliament will be... So I've are said, you saying I've to me it won't happen? A, we've made is, a commitment is, this a, is this a threat to we've, members of Parliament that we won't, won't no, have it's that not money? A, I'm not, so it'll happen irrespective of it? That was just my question. It is not. I have said we have made a commitment to the yes. National Health Service. We made that because we believe it is right for the National Health Service. You've raised a number of other issues in your questions, and I come back to the point that those are exactly the sort of issues that members may be thinking about when they're looking at the... You know, we have a, a decision on December the 11th whether to deliver on the vote of the British people in a way that protects jobs and our economy and livelihoods and allows a smooth and orderly exit from the EU or not. Right. So... Um, just coming back to that letter to the nation, you, you've written to the nation, you're now travelling around the country. Um, why won't you now ask them if this is the Brexit that they voted for? Is this what they meant by Brexit? The, well, I think you're aware, Chairman, of my position in relation to the question of the second referendum. Parliament over, if I may, the, the, there are several aspects to this. Parliament overwhelmingly gave the vote to the British people as to whether or not to leave the European Union. I believe it is a matter of the issue of the integrity of politicians and people's trust in politicians that we actually deliver on that vote. And uh, you know, there were many people who um, came to democracy, who voted in that election, who hadn't voted before, and I think whose uh, views about democracy would be severely damaged if they felt that politicians just said, no, we didn't like the answer you gave, so why don't you have another look? That's the first, the, first, the first point I make. I think it is important for our democracy that we deliver on the vote that people took in 2016. But actually, if you, if you look at the practicalities of this issue, um, it is clear 
that any second referendum that uh, would be held, if that were the, uh, the case, would not be able to be held by the, uh, by the 29th of March next year. We would be leaving on the, uh, on the 29th of March next year. Um, and so, it, you know, what, would, what would be the circumstance in, in that but thing? You would have to You'd extend have to, Article 50 have to, extend to allow, Article 50. allow for a referendum, which yes, but, the European but, but Union have a, indicated a, they would be no, no, happy to there's do. A paradox, there's a paradox here. If you extend Article 50, actually, you're then in the business of renegotiating the deal. This is, this is the point. The deal, the deal is the deal at this point in time. And people have look at the deal. Uh, but, setting aside any concerns I have about extending Article 50, actually not delivering on the vote of the British people. That's my fundamental concern about all these suggestions that of a second referendum or going back to the people with a vote in some form. People voted to leave the European Union. It is our duty to deliver that for people. Right, but um, my understanding is that Article 50 could be extended to allow for a referendum on your deal. It wouldn't negate your deal, it wouldn't cancel the deal. It would just allow you to decide, uh, sorry, it would allow the people to, to give you um, th th their verdict on whether this is what they meant by Brexit. No, the, the, the first of all, I mean, my, my point about democracy still stands. I think it's absolutely important that we deliver on the vote that people gave. Having given, overwhelmingly, this parliament gave people that vote, uh, and I really believe that we should deliver on that. But no, any, any, what is clear is that any um, uh, extension to Article 50, anything like that, reopens the negotiations, reopens the deal. And that, um, at that point, the deal can go, frankly, in any direction. So is that what you have been explicitly told? I'm sorry, I it's must move on in a minute to other colleagues, but I, just, I think that's a really important point. Have you been told by the European Union that you would have to reopen negotiations were you to hold a referendum based on your deal to ask the British people this is, whether this, this is, is what they meant by Brexit? Is this their this informed is, this consent? Is what is very clear and what has been made clear is that this is the deal that they have negotiated with yes. the European Union. So any suggestion of that that deal uh, might be rejected. Any, I mean, I, I still come back to the point that actually I think the most important reason, the most important reason why we should not be going down the route of a second referendum is that we ask the British people, they've given us their view and we should deliver on that view. There are different views yes, as to how we should on. deliver on that view, but I believe that we should deliver on it. I believe we owe it to the British people, having given them the choice to actually uh, go make that choice happen for them. Mm. Well, I'm afraid it would be a bit, in my view, like wheeling someone into the operating theatre based on a consent form they'd signed two, two years ago without really knowing what the operation was and being able to give proper, valid, informed consent after weighing up the risks and benefits of the actual operation. Would that yeah. not be a reasonable point? Well, but I think another point, I think if you were to go down the, the route, we would simply find ourselves in a period of more uncertainty and more division in this country. Now is the time for this country to come back together and to, to look at our future outside the European Union, not to be uh, encouraging further division. Well, I must move on. Um, we're coming on next to uh, the constitutional issues and uh, opening Sir Bernard. Uh, Chair, thank you. I'm afraid we're going to need an extra five or ten minutes, and I hope that's all right. Well, um, I'll need to check. I've got a plane thank, to catch, I'm afraid, well, so no, I'll I appreciate try and speak that. quickly. I will, I, brevity indicates no lack of respect to you, Prime Minister. Um, just briefly, are you aware of a single pharmaceutical company or supplier that is not able to assure its customers that they will receive their drugs on time if we leave without a deal? Well, I, I, I haven't been made aware of such no, a No, I don't think there is. They're all assuring their customers they will get their drugs. And, of course, the government was... <coughs> severely criticised after the Brexit vote because there had been no preparation for a, a, a Leave vote. Um, but that will be two years and nine months to 29th of March. Will the government be prepared to leave on the 29th of March without a deal if those are the circumstances? We will be leaving the European Union on the 29th of March. And the government will be fully prepared? We are, and we are putting preparations in place. Good. Um, and just on the forecasts, uh, the Treasury, under George Osborne, did produce forecasts just before the referendum in May 2016, um, forecasting a collapse in growth and jobs. How accurate were those forecasts? 
Uh, well, I think we've seen from what has happened that uh, actually the reaction was rather different to those forecasts. If I may, the uh, analysis that has been put forward by the government is not a forecast, it is an analysis of the trade impact. Yes, and what you said was the uh, economic analysis doesn't deal with the decisions the government might take. That's correct, isn't it? Yes. So basically they're rubbish, aren't they? Well, I think there is, a, there is a, a difference of opinion about the benefit of uh, forecast analysis and so forth. The point is that the analysis only looks at certain elements. It doesn't look at every variable that can uh, uh, be brought in, uh, can affect what happens to our economy in the, uh, in the future. But it is the analysis that we uh, said we will bring forward to show the trade impacts of the various but it's, uh, it, it scenarios. Is, it's quite something when our own Chancellor and our own Bank of England Governor trashes the future of our country as part of a propaganda exercise. That's that what's is, happening, isn't that it? That is not what is happening. That is not what is happening. No, on the, on the it constitutional is, it is matters. If I may, the Treasury Select Committee has made clear that they wanted analysis from the government and analysis from the Bank of England. Both of those have been provided. They're different sorts of work. The Bank of England's is a forecast over five years, the, um, which, as I said earlier, does show that there would be a deal dividend from the deal that I've negotiated with the European Union. The uh, government's analysis is analysis of the trade impact over a 15, uh, looking ahead to 15 years. But of course, it doesn't um, uh, reflect actions, other actions and other variables that would affect our economy. Now, on the question of cabinet collective responsibility, one of the most contentious bits of the political declaration is Article 23, which states the economic partnership should build and improve on the single customs territory provided in the withdrawal <coughs> agreement. Who authorised officials in Brussels to negotiate on that basis? Well, this is, this is a set of words which have come to take on a meaning which uh, is not the, uh, the meaning behind those, uh, behind those words. Uh, the, what has happened in relation to but the who concept... who authorised? My only question is who authorised... Well, the, the political declaration was agreed by politicians, was no, no, agreed but, but by ministers. who authorised at what time? The officials to negotiate those words? Well, these, these were ongoing negotiations that were taking place throughout this political declaration, so you won't right until that the question. point at which it was, uh, right until the point at which it was agreed, there was var variations uh, being made. This is, this is a That's, form of I'm words. I'm asking a who question, this is, this Prime is, Minister. Sorry? Who authorised that? Well, ultimately, I sat down with the European Union leaders and agreed right. this political okay, but your, declaration. Dominic Raab, as ex EU Secretary, subsequently stated that he only found out about this policy on Tuesday the 13th of November, the day before your long cabinet meeting. Why was that? The, well, the cabinet came together on the, the next day to look at the text that had been in preparation over that whole period of time. Text was changing in a variety of ways over that period of time. So it was changed without his knowledge. No, I didn't say that. Well, I he said, did. I, well, he said that. He, uh, the this this piece of text is something that has been assumed to mean something that it does not well, mean. Not, regardless and of what is, it means, that is, he clearly no, thought it, it was matter. very important. It does matter what this text means, actually. The single customs, first of all, the single customs territory was something we were able to achieve in the negotiations because the uh, European Union had started off saying that Northern Ireland should be a separate customs territory from the rest of uh, from Great Britain. We argued from February through to October that that should not be the case and we got the agreement on the single customs territory. What uh, has also lain behind that agreement on the single customs territory is the divisibility of the four freedoms. The divisibility of the four freedoms, or its indivisibility as the EU would look at it, the United and Customs relationship the United Kingdom could have with the European Union in the, in the future. The, the fact of the acceptance of the divisibility of the four freedoms in that... in discussing issues which are the responsibility of other ministers consulting ministerial colleagues as appropriate. So why was the DEXU Secretary not consulted on this? The, the DEXU Secretary was consulted, was being consulted on an ongoing basis on text that was being developed within the, uh, within the negotiations. But you de he was deputising for you in these negotiations and you didn't consult him. Why isn't that a breach of the ministerial but, but code? There were, the DEXU secretary was being consulted, as were other ministers, on an ongoing basis when this well, political declaration was, when this, 
when the political declaration was being put together. I think I've made my point. Yes, uh, Prime Minister, uh, good morning. Um, there's an urgent question which is taking place right now, actually, on the advice of the Attorney General and the publication of it, and I'm going to be asking you some questions about that myself now. Um, the, uh, the Ministerial Code state, states that it is of paramount importance that all Ministers give accurate and truthful information to Parliament, correcting any, any inadvertent error at the earliest opportunity and the knowingly misleading Parliament leads to resignation. I asked you at the Liaison Committee on the 18th of July whether you had asked the law officers for their opinion on checkers in good time beforehand as required by the Code and as a critical legal consideration as it sets out. You merely replied that the law officer sits around the Cabinet table and is thereby consulted, which is clearly not what the Code requires. Yet again, on Monday this week, after you had signed the withdrawal agreement, I asked you um, a question on your statement, how this being a treaty, which is the, what this is, and only a treaty, it can be lawfully compatible with the overriding statutory express repeal of the whole of the European Communities Act 1972, and whether you had sought the legal opinion of the Attorney General on, on this critical legal consideration in good time before your signature. You did not reply to that question. I ask it again. Did you seek his opinion on that issue and will you publish that advice as required by the vote on the humble address and which is directly relevant to compliance with the code and the full consider critical consideration that this legal matter clearly requires by the Attorney General before your signature and on the withdrawal agreement and it's being laid before the House. When the, well, Sir William, you asked me this question about the fact that we had repealed in the European Union Withdrawal Act, we'd repealed the whole of the European Communities Act 1972 and that this was um, uh, therefore incompatible legally with the withdrawal agreement and with the political declaration. It was always, it has always been the case that the reason, the reason we passed the European Union Withdrawal Act in relation to the um, uh, bringing the European uh, EU law, the key into UK law, was to ensure that we had a working uh, statute book when we left the European Union on the 29th of March 2019. It was always the case that alongside that, whatever the withdrawal agreement required would be legislated for in Parliament before the 29th of March 2019. But you can't so that, that there would no, there will be no incompatibility with these two. Well, it is, it is, it is up to Parliament whether it is accepts. The, but it was always the case, and it was always made clear that whatever was in the withdrawal agreement would be legislated for by Parliament, and that that legislation obviously would take account, uh, as it would in the implementation period, of the necessity of making any, uh, putting any position into place to continue to enable the smooth function of our laws and the smooth function of that statute. I mean, this is a very unusual situation in that this withdrawal agreement cuts across an Act of Parliament which quite clearly overrides a treaty, and that is a matter of law and a matter of fact. But I do really want you to ask the question, did you in fact <laughs> seek the opinion of the Attorney General on those questions and also in relation to the Chequers questions? I'm getting no answers to these questions. And you will know that we do not uh, uh, set out when we do or do not uh, seek the opinion of the law officers and we do not um, uh, publish the full advice of the law officers, and I answered that uh, a point in uh, earlier this week. Uh, the, we, set out, the humble we set out in the white paper, legislating for the withdrawal agreement, that the withdrawal agreement bill will make amends to the Act, to the withdrawal, European Union Withdrawal Act, to ensure it reflects our commitments under the withdrawal agreement. Now, obviously, Parliament has a job of scrutinising those provisions when we bring forward the bill, as it does with all legislation. But it was clear at the time that there was a recognition at the time of the interaction of the Withdrawal Act, the repeal of the European Communities Act 1972 and the legislative requirements of any future withdrawal agreement. It was set out to Parliament the process that would take place that related to those. It was very clear 
and uh, I've just set it well, out at again. this moment in time, the treaty is quite clearly inconsistent with the Withdrawal Act, and I don't think anyone can dispute that. And it was, but we were always clear that what was necessary in the treaty, what was necessary in the withdrawal agreement, was would be put into place with the, or if, if there were amendments necessary, they would be put into place with the withdrawal agreement bill. Well, we don't have much more time. I simply say, I just don't think you'll get that through Parliament in the withdrawal uh, bill uh, when it comes up and it's inconsistent with the existing repeal of the. European Community Act 1972, which is absolutely axiomatic and absolutely fundamental to our leaving the European Union. Well, the, the, uh, the, and the reason we uh, undertook what we did in the European Union Withdrawal Act was to ensure that we did have, a, uh, you know, a, there was no cliff edge in relation to the laws that were operating, that there was a smooth functioning of our, uh, our laws and our statute book when we leave the, uh, when we ceased to become a member of the European Union. That was preparatory, that was important to do, preparatory work, because for any circumstances of leaving the European Union, it was important to have that in place. Um, I think what, what you've just said to me is that if Parliament ratifies the withdrawal agreement, Parliament won't agree to put in place the legislative measures necessary to enact that withdrawal agreement. What I'm really saying is the repeal of the European Community Act 1972 is so fundamental to this entire operation it is quite inconceivable that under the withdrawal agreement and subsequent legislation, you then modify the European Community Act 1972 and reduce the impact of the Act of Parliament that was already passed on the 26th of June with Royal Assent. The, the circumstances in which that is, any amendments are necessary, are the circumstances in which we put into place the implementation period which is there to ensure that there is an orderly exit from the European Union, that we have a transition through to the future relationship, that businesses are able to continue to operate as they do today, that citizens know where they stand. Uh, this is about providing reassurance <coughs> to businesses and people across our country um, uh, that uh, this process will be a smooth and orderly one and that they can have that uh, they can have that reassurance and that confidence i, I think, think it is entirely is responsible for respect. parliament to recognize we recognize that we're leaving the european union there is no doubt that we're leaving the european union the question is how we do that and if we do that in a way that protects jobs if we do that in a way that ensures that we're able to give people and businesses <coughs> the reassurance that they need as they're going through this uh, going through this process i'm not sure that many people will be reassured that the idea that the European Community Act 1972 is going to be played around with in that way, given the fact that, they, as you quite rightly said, that was a decision that was taken on the referendum vote itself. But I think I have to leave well, it at that. I, I think people will be will want reassurance of knowing that there is protection for their jobs, that businesses are able to, uh, and that as we leave the European Union, that the, there will not be the disruption that, uh, would, that uh, people have said would be the case if we had not had that implementation period and that transition to the future relationship. So, William, we, we do have to end there. Prime Minister, thank you very much. And, you. and I very much hope as well that you will agree to come back to this committee should the vote not pass and we are in uh, uncharted waters um, after in, in early in the new year. Well, thank I, you. I, uh, I was going to say, I, I think we have arrangements for the number of uh, times I come to the committee in, uh, in any year. Yes. Well, uh, the Prime Minister there finishing her evidence session, her regular uh, evidence session before the Liaison Committee, as she reminded them uh, at the end when they asked for an extra session in the event of a vote against uh, her uh, on the 11th of December. Uh, with me is our political correspondent, Tamara Cohen. Uh, Tamara, what would be the main points of that? Well, I think the, the point the Prime Minister was trying to stress throughout is we're definitely leaving on the 29th of March. There are some members of the committee who were pressing her on uh, would Article 50 be extended, second referendum uh, and so on. The Prime Minister was very uh, keen to stress that we are leaving, that free movement will be ending. And so the questions then led on to what happens in the event of no deal, because the Prime Minister was actually asked quite a, a pointed question by Yvette Cooper 
is it right that in the national interest you should allow no deal to happen since all of the government's forecasts suggest it would be extremely damaging? The Prime Minister said that she basically couldn't rule it out. She said uh, we have to prepare for every single scenario and that's what the government is doing. And when she was asked questions about whether she was concerned, for example, about the future of NHS patients, uh, she just said that the contingency plans are there and ready to be activated. The other thing that I thought was interesting, she seemed very much on top of the detail. I mean, considering she's got two weeks to convince MPs to vote for this deal, I'm not sure she won round anymore but she was certainly very much on top of all the articles in the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration she was very well versed when she was talking about our future relationship with the EU and she was, you know, the, the MPs picked apart many, many uncertainties that are there. She first of all said that while frictionless trade is something she wants, uh, she conceded that many in the EU are yet to be convinced that she, we should have it. And then there was quite an amusing moment when Tom Tugendhat, the Tory MP, said to her, are we going to be friends with benefits uh, with the EU? And the Prime Minister looked a little bit confused about what he might have meant. Indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Tamara. Uh, well, uh, let's bring in uh, uh, the uh, two people here to discuss the comments in today's newspapers. They are the columnists for The Times, Rachel Sylvester and the head of politics at The Mirror, Jason Beatty. I mean, what was striking about that was Mrs May saying, we are leaving, and uh, basically every committee chairman pretty much saying, well, you're not going to win the vote. Yes, and, and I think picking up what Tamara said, one of the curious aspects about this is, is she's struggling to sell her policy. I mean, we've had, you know, almost nine hours with Theresa May in the last 10 days in the Commons. We've just had 90 minutes in front of this committee. And I don't see any kind of great way she's taking this forward. I mean, she's not winning people over. It's just this kind of very strict line she's got of we are leaving, these are the terms. But it's a very bad sales job and she needs to brush on her patter quickly. How do you think she's doing? Is she persuading well, anybody? It's very strange. I can't understand what their strategy is because all the numbers seem to point to her losing this vote in the House of Commons. And she doesn't seem to be winning anything, anybody over. And there's this peculiar, almost like a sort of general election campaign going on. We talk of TV debates. She's going around the country. Um, you know, but actually, it's not the voters out there who are going to be determining what happens. And then also, in the backdrop, you've got all these... You know, it's an election campaign against the... Saying, oh, well, and our policy is going to make you poorer and it's all going to be terrible. It's, it's very, very odd. OK, thank you both. <laughs>